Good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? You guys respond. How are you tonight? Yeah. It's great to see you guys all here. Uh, my name is Maddie Chrisman, and I am a student here at Central. I'm a special needs education major, and um, I'm here to talk to you about my story and the story of a few others here on campus. First, I would like to start this off by telling you, number one, I am going to make you uncomfortable. Yes. I'm going to make you uncomfortable because you know what? What's uncomfortable is the statistics. Number two, there will be a little bit of profanity in this. I'm letting you know because there are quotes in my presentation of things that have been said to survivors of assault that are profane and dirty. So, let's get that presentation in. Bailey's getting it up for me. So first, I'm going to take a poll real quick. If you could raise your hand if you know someone who's been affected by sexual assault or if you are a survivor of sexual assault, let's see a raise of hands. Now look around the room. That's absurd to me. It hurts, it's sad, and you know, it's something that I want to change. So this is Rock Against Rape 2016. My name once again is Maddie. I'm a special education major, I'm a survivor, I'm a warrior, and I'm an activist. You want to go to the next one, baby? So a little bit about me. If you want to go to the next slide. So I'm not standing up here just as a random person for you. Um, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Oh, next one. Sorry. Oh, back. Back. One more. Oh, okay. They're not there. But uh, a little bit about me. I'm 19 years old and I have a lifetime of experience under my belt. I've played football for 10 plus years now, and I'm not talking powder puff football, I'm talking 11 on 11 tackle football. Eight years with the guys and two years with the girls. Um, I've traveled across the country to Arizona with my fiance and my dog, and um, I've gone to a pro football game, I have tattoos and piercings, and I've been diagnosed with PTSD. And if you don't know what PTSD is, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. So first I have a video for you guys that is called the unacceptable acceptance letter when you get into college. We have audio hooked up to that. Okay, so we don't have sound in this video, but if you want to hit play, um, in this they talk about, oh, you might be able to do subtitles. So in this video, you see students opening up acceptance letters from college, and they are uh, mock videos, they're not real acceptance letters, but they say you've been accepted to the class of 2021, and in the fall, we will not protect you from your rapist. He will be suspended for one day, and then you're on your own. And sadly, this is true for so many survivors out there who are assaulted on a college campus. You can go ahead and go to the next video, if you don't have some worth looking up. It's called the Unacceptable Acceptance Letter. You can find it on YouTube. Um, it's a great program to look into. So these are some statistics I'm going to get into first. 90% of women who are sexually assaulted in college know they're attacker. And one in 33 men are victims of attempted or completed rape. 60% of college assaults occur in the residence halls. And one in five women experience some form of sexual assault in college. So I have a little fact for you guys. Central Washington University has to put out an annual safety report every year, and they just put out their annual safety report back in September, and it said in the last three years that there have only been 10 assaults reported on campus. Now, if we look at those statistics of one in five women alone, just one in five women alone, we have a campus of 10,000 students. Does anybody know how many students that would be in their college career? Anyone super good at math off the top of your head? No. It's at least 2,000 students. And um, so in the statistics, it says that only one occurred in the residence halls, and that was in 2014. All other nine occurred somewhere on campus, whether it was outside, in the l l in the library. And these are only the results that were investigated. So we can go on to the next one. Women are more likely to be assaulted in their first two years of college. I remember coming to Central and hearing, protect yourself, don't walk alone at night. These are things you can do to protect yourself against rape. And I was really hurt because there wasn't, don't rape, find consent. 
ask, hey, is it okay if we keep going? There are sexy ways to ask for consent. Most commonly reported days for college sexual assault are Fridays and Saturdays. Does anybody have any idea on why? Parties. Alcohol, parties, it happens, it's college. Parties happen, I mean, sorry mom and dad. <laughs> Most commonly reported months for sexual assault are September and October. Does anybody know why that happens as well? Why those are the most reported? New freshmen. Um, 68% of sexual assaults are not reported to police. And 98% of rapists will never spend a day in prison. And a lot of these statistics are from the website called RAIN, and they're an amazing organization, RAIN with two eyes. Let's go ahead and do the next one. So there's lots of questions about the truth about rape that people ask all the time. Um, was she just crying rape? Only 2% of all rape reports are given falsely. Now, out of the vast majority, that's nothing. Two, uh, were they just at the wrong place at the wrong time? Now, we've already seen that two in every three rape victims know their attacker, so realistically, you're not just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, was she drunk and asking for it? Now that you've learned from our books over here that drunk sex is not consensual sex. 100% of assault cases involving alcohol or rape. Were they dressed too sexy? One in every seven rape victims are under the age of 12. Raise your hand if you think a 12-year-old is sexy. Not one hand. You want to go ahead and go to the next slide? What's wrong with this picture? Percentages of campuses disclosing zero reported incidents of rape is 91%. And only 9% of colleges across this country report more than one. Now, if you want to go to the next one. But that doesn't happen here. That's what I heard. My oh, the picture's up there. Hold on one second. We have to fix that. Talk amongst yourselves. assault across all campuses. Uh, it's like two in three uh, people will experience sexual assault before the age of 18. They're getting the I didn't enjoy it. I hated it. I felt so dirty after and I blamed myself because I gave in. 
A yes under pressure is not consent. I'm only hurting you because I love you. At age 16, I was at a beach party with friends, and my guy friend and I were alone, and he grabbed my neck and forced my head between his legs. He was upset because I never put out. We never spoke again, and classes with him were painfully awkward. I didn't rape you. You were wet. You wanted to fuck me. Me being wet was blood from forced penetration. My experiences with sexual assault have caused me to feel guilt and shame with even healthy sex. I struggled with a sense of guilt even with healthy sex, and I struggled to react, relax with my boyfriend because it conflicts that I now enjoy something that once caused me so much pain. Men are raped and sexually abused too, and don't forget about us. I know you're not down to fuck when you're sober, but do you think you're drunk enough now? These people are very important to me. I have their consent to share a small story about them. On the left is my goddaughter's grandmother, and on the right is my goddaughter's mother. They didn't know about each other. Um, those are two of the strongest women I know in my life. So, the one on the left, her name is Alicia, and it says, I was two years old, he was my mother's boyfriend, and I was just a baby. And the one on the right says, on my 15th birthday, my cousin and I were drugged, and she was raped in front of me. I was blamed for it for the last five years. So if you want to go to the next one, that's me. Um, it says you should have kept it in the family. And that was a quote from my grandmother when she found out I was pressing charges. Thank you. I'm going to start with my story, which started on December 24th, 2008. And the judicial part of it ended April 10th, 2015. And over that was 2,299 days of pure agony and terror. Go to the next one. That's me. So if you look at this, it's out of 100 people. Only two are falsely accused. Rest of rapists reported in face trial. I'm right there in face trial. How about the next one? This was a picture of Christmas Eve in 2008. This was taken the night before I was raped. Um, that's me, 12 years old, and that's my rapist at 15 years old. Do you want to go to the next one? So experiencing trial was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I, um, once we pressed charges the night my parents found out, two years before we went to trial. It was almost two years in the dock. That moment, I was talking to police on the phone for hours, and they called me every day to make sure I was okay, make sure I wasn't going to hurt myself, and make sure I still wanted to do this. Um, and it was agony. Once I came to college, I had to call the Grant County Judicial Court every Monday to figure out if my trial was going that week. Every quarter, I had to tell my prof professors, there could be a week where I will not be here. And they would always ask me why. You know, that was a really awkward conversation. And it was at the point where I didn't know about the Wellness Center and how they could reach out and talk for me. And I eventually went to them and they did, and it was awesome. I got the call on April 1st, 2015, thinking it was a joke, that we were going to go to trial. My um, state attorney, because it was technically state versus my cousin, not me versus my cousin, um, told me that they had offered him a lesser deal and he decided not to take the deal. So his lesser deal would have been six years in prison, and the deal he decided to go to trial for was 25 years. So he was interviewed, and we went to trial, and I gave my testimony, and his grandmother, which is not the same because he is my adopted cousin, sat in the stands behind the attorney that was asking me questions and laughed as I gave my testimony. And my attorney said we need to stop, and I sobbed and left the room. Nearly collapsed outside as they came around the corner and stood there staring at me. I had to be rushed downstairs into my attorney's office. My fiance had to drive from Ellensburg to Ephrata, which is about an hour, and I also needed my service animal to be brought to me because I thought I could do it alone. When he was asked, uh, he eventually when he was uh, interviewed, he was he said yes. I had sex with her, but it was consensual. How can a 12-year-old give consent when in Washington State the age of consent is 16? And these are, I have right here, a printed picture of his testimony to one of the detectives. And it says, I asked Curtis what MMW was doing to show that she wanted it. Curtis took a pause and stated he could not remember how she was showing him because it was so long ago. I got to hear this, my family got to hear this, Everyone in the courtroom got to hear this, 
And the silence was so heartbreaking. And I'm going to let you guys experience how long that silence was. So I'm going to ask the question, be silent, and then give the response. How did MMW show that she wanted it? I can't remember because it was so long ago. It was a 16 second pause, but those 16 seconds are so painful. And it said that Curtis stated he couldn't remember all the details or facts, but he did know he did not use force because he wasn't that kind of guy. And I asked Curtis if he ever talked to MMW about what happened, and Curtis said that he had never talked about it with her. I asked what was said or what they did after having sex, and Curtis said they just went up to sleep, and he went back over by Daniel and the TV and went to sleep. Daniel's my brother who was in the room at the time, and um, it was heartbreaking because I remember I had a journal at the time, and the journal entry for April 8th or April 9th said he admitted to it. I cried. The next day said April 10th, not guilty. My father cried. So if you want to go to the next picture, this was a picture that was used against me in trial. Um, does anybody have an answer when someone says, cheese, what do you do when you're getting a picture taken? You smile. So this was a photo that was used against me in court. This is our family. My rapist is in the middle of the black shirt, and I'm on the left with my father. And um, it was used against me because I looked happy. And how could someone look happy in a picture with their rapist? Um, that was my grandmother who brought that to trial and testified against me. Um, and when he was found not guilty, I received a lot of hate mail. I received a lot of dirty looks. I have a Tumblr account and received death threats saying that I should kill myself. And my fiance even got some saying that why would you marry a dirty liar? If you want to go to the next one, um, I will never say I am a victim, because I'm not. You don't tell someone who has cancer that they're a victim. You tell them they're a survivor. And I am a survivor of sexual assault, and I have post-traumatic stress disorder, which is hard to admit sometimes because it's not a very well-known um, thing in the line of anything outside of the military. And um, after trial, I actually wrote a poem that was not heard very well last year, so I'm going to read it. Dear Mr. Eric Kyle Curtis, why did you lie? Why did you lie over and over again that you didn't touch me? And why did you tell them you didn't touch me because I was a big kid? Why, what does my weight have to do with anything that you did to me? Dear Mr. Eric Kyle Curtis, why did you tell them you never touched me because I always had boyfriends? not because I was your cousin. Dear Mr. Eric Kyle Curtis, what made you tell the truth? What made you finally say that you raped me? Oh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. We had sex, but I never said no, so it was consent. Dear Mer Mr. Eric Kyle Curtis, how could I have said no? With your 180 pound body on top of me, holding my mouth closed and my shoulder down on the bed, you left bruises that night, more bruises that could ever be seen. Dear Mr. Eric Kyle Curtis, and you know, I really, I must have wanted to see my dad so, cry so much that he wanted to leave the room. And then you know, I really wanted to see my mom fall as she knew she was losing her mother and her brother and to you. And you know, Mr. Eric Kyle Curtis, I wanted to see my brother so mad at what you did to me that he nearly punched my grandmother. Not that she didn't deserve it. I wanted my own grandmother to testify against me, and I wanted my own grandmother to tell me I was lying. Dear Mr. Eric Kyle Curtis, I probably wanted the shaking and trembling hands whenever someone touched me, and I wanted to be able to, I wanted to be afraid to hug my own father. Dear Mr. Eric Kyle Curtis, I wanted to be the, I wanted the burden of paying forty dollars a month for pills that keep me sane, and I definitely wanted to be diagnosed with severe PTSD at the age of eighteen, and I wanted to have an emotional breakdown three days into my freshman year of college. And dear Eric Kyle Curtis. I wanted you to do this to me to change my perspective of life forever. But you know what, Mr. Eric Kyle Curtis? You will not control me. 
You have not ruined me, and you will not keep me from dreaming and from running, and you will not keep me from falling in love with the girl of my dreams and marrying her one day. 